everybody. My name is Lu Wang, and I'm very excited today to have an opportunity to tell you why data quality is the key to successful competition in a world after open banking. So a little about myself. I graduated from Harvard University in 2011. And since then, I've spent my entire career in data analytics, working in various industries, such as basic science, digital marketing, fintech. And um, I've seen a lot of companies try to transform their futures through data. This is my passion and the focus of my career. For a summary of some of the executive positions that I've held as a consultant or as an employee, um, I've helped a lot of different companies master their data acquisition and usage approaches. We won't stay on this slide for too long. Let's move on. We're here to talk about open banking. Specifically, we're here to talk about technology and banking. So fintechs are a very interesting type of company because they blend the entrepreneurial dream with the technology dream. Let's talk a little bit about what that is. If you are a technology entrepreneur, you want to do these three things to succeed. You want to identify a growing market that has a service that can be digitized, technology. Then the current dominant strategy is to develop a mobile app, collect and use the data that you collect from the mobile app to deliver a seamless, fast service that's competitive with the non-digital one. And because you are so competitive, you build a huge happy customer base, attracting people with your customer experience. And then you sell your company and you succeed. Open banking is going to change everything. Here's why. Think about what open banking does in the banking industry. They standardize the data and technology used by all companies that participate. This means all companies that participate will be sharing data and technology to all provide that seamless customer experience. Furthermore, the central bank is going to provide a platform for people to do this. This means customers will move freely between companies that participate in open banking. So the old dream of building a digital application that only you have, that digitizes the service, where you acquire a customer base and you sell your company because of your customer base, because they stick with you. That dynamic of mobile app, customer acquisition, that dynamic is no longer competitive. That strategy is dead. So if that strategy is dead, how will fintechs compete when customers can go anywhere they want? We have to get back to fundamentals. The new strategy is exactly an old strategy, which is this. For a fintech to be competitive, you have to deliver exactly the right financial instrument to the customer that wants it at a competitive price. You can't count on them sticking with you because it's hard for them to move away. In other words, you have to know the right product, offer it at the best terms possible at exactly the right time. So let's compare this dream to the old dream. What are the steps you have to do? To be competitive in the new world, you need to develop customizable products that a customer could want. You have to know what terms your institution can offer responsibly, profitably, viably to a specific customer. You have to know the customer well, and you have to know your products well. And of course, you have to deliver that product quickly. You have to be able to make this decision quickly because your competition is also trying to deliver the product at exactly the right time and speed is king. How do you do this? You will need high quality data to deliver this type of value to your customer. You cannot wait one quarter for underwriting. You have to be able to make this decision nearly instantaneously. You need high quality data. 
I've talked a lot about high quality data. I think now is a good time to define what that means. High quality data really boils down to two things. Number one, your record about a customer is complete. You have one place to look up all the important information about one customer. So that's completeness. Number two, it's usable in many situations. It's ready to go. You don't need to cleanse it. You don't need to process it in order to use it. It's been prepared to be useful. Here are some signs that you do not have high quality data. If you have to look in more than one place to find customer information, if there's somebody's job to prepare and extract data and put it into an Excel document or CSV, you don't have high quality data. It is not ready to use for many situations. Um, another sign that you're in a low quality situation is that there are people's jobs to correct entries in spreadsheets and databases. Or you have to ask an engineer what this data means. It means your data is not ready to be used. These are all symptoms that you will struggle, that it will be a challenge to compete in a world where customers can move freely, searching for the best price or a product that suits them. So let's talk about companies that are ready to compete. These companies are data-driven companies. They have already invested in two secret super weapons that have always been used to maintain and improve their data quality. And this is data management and analytics. In the past, when anyone can make a mobile app and sell their company, data-driven companies quietly, sometimes unassumingly, spend their time making profit while mobile apps get sold. But when we get back to fundamentals and the customer has the ability to move, the data-driven companies will be rewarded because they can customize their service. So knowing this, what can you do immediately to become more data-driven and improve your data quality? I'm gonna tell you three things. But before I do, I wanna share the root cause of why data quality is often so low. Number one, companies don't know the inventory of their data. I find it remarkable that companies maintain inventory of how much office furniture they have, right? They know how many desks they bought, they know how many chairs they bought, but they do not know how much data they have. They don't know where to find it. They don't know which databases contain what customer information and how much of it and whether or not the records are complete. If the company does know their inventory, sometimes they don't know their lineage, meaning they know what data they have, but they don't know where this data came from. They don't know which department produced it. They don't know which departments processed it and changed it. Remember, there could be people's jobs. Their entire jobs are to edit the data that's already been collected. So they don't know what data was entered by the customer or what data was amended by an employee. Lastly, the third challenge is sometimes the data no matter how well you document it, it just doesn't make sense. You see a ton of data, you have a lot of data, but you don't know what this data means. This is nothing to be ashamed of. The tools and technologies and techniques to maintain and improve data quality used to be very expensive. 20 years ago, a lot of companies couldn't afford people to build databases for them, but it has never been cheaper or easier to invest your time in improving your data quality. But a lot of companies don't know that they have to do this. This is the heart of good digitization strategy. So there's no shame. We just have to do it. So let's talk about doing it. Here are some things that you can do, but shouldn't do. When people think about unknown inventory, unknown lineage, and incomprehensible data, they often gravitate towards solutions that they've heard about in the past, such as create a data dictionary, document all of your processing activities, or cleanse and annotate your data to make it fit for use. Here's the problem. 
all of these strategies work 20 years ago when you only have like one database with 10 tables. We don't live in that world anymore. Okay? We produce data as quickly as we think these days because our lives are living online. These methods are reactive, they're too slow. And worst of all, they don't fix the problem. They don't fix data quality. They're there to react to the low quality data that exists, but they do not deal with upstream practices to get us out of this mess. To drive this point home, this is why I need you guys to know that sometimes the obvious solutions are bad solutions. This is a data dictionary. There's one row in the dictionary, one entry in a dictionary for each type of data, and it tells you, you know, what type of data it is, where you could find it. And the thing is, with databases, the name of the data field and its participation in a table tells you what the meaning of the data is. The business transaction UUID is clearly a unique ID for the transactions table. The contract code is clearly the contract code for a contract and so on and so forth. Right. Dictionaries tell you information about an item, but let's say you wanted to find, you wanted to find something. Let's say you wanted to find customer email. Take a look at this dictionary. Where is customer email located? We have to read through. Okay, here's customer email. Strange. I was hoping that I could just find email, but here I have customer email. Okay, it's in the customers table. Where's the customers table? Mm, maybe I'll ask an engineer and they'll point me to the customers table. Okay. But notice, we had to read the entries in the database to find what we have to read the entries in the dictionary to find what we were looking for. Thankfully, customer email starts with a C, so it's kind of early in the dictionary. But what if you're looking for something that's more mysterious, like transaction ID? Do you read the whole dictionary to find transaction ID, or do you jump to the section that starts with T? Well, what if your transaction IDs Start with the letter B, business transaction UUID. This is the problem with dictionaries. To find what you're looking for, you have to read the whole dictionary or get very lucky that the page you turn to has the information that you want. There's a much better way to do this. If you want to make search easy, you need a hierarchical index. Here's an example. Here, all customer data is in green. All merchant and contract data is in black. Account data in red, transaction data in blue. Think about our previous question. We wanted to find the customer's email. Do I need to read the whole dictionary? Of course not. Do I have to look at this whole picture? Of course not. I just look at the customer tables. How many customer tables do I have? Three, customer types, customers, customer purchase. Where would the email be? Probably not in customer types, almost certainly in the customer's table. So now, and only now, do I look at the detailed descriptions of the columns. Ah, customer email. Indeed, it's in the customer's table. What if I want to find the transaction ID? Do I have to read this whole picture? Nope. Let's look at blue. Transaction, transaction types. Transaction ID is about a transaction, so it's not in transaction types. We look at the transactions table. Sure enough, it's there. Each time we wanted to find something, we only had to ask ourselves two questions. One, what is this data about? Is it about customer objects or transaction objects? Then, which table should I look at? Within two actions, we find what we're looking for. There are 54 pieces of data in this picture. To find the two things we're looking for, we only had to look at two pieces of data. This is a great way to represent information, to facilitate search, to improve the usability of your data. When you improve the usability of your data, you have higher quality data. Let's look at how much space it would take to represent this information 
in a data dictionary. There are 54 entries here. There are 54 entries here. Which one is easier to find? Transaction ID. This is what I mean by some solutions that are obvious that worked 20 years ago may not work anymore. So the number one thing you can do to improve your data quality immediately is to index your data, is to hierarchically index your data. My recommendation for doing this is to look at your enterprise and think about its organization. Most companies are organized by department. Every single department has activities, activities that produce or collect data. So you start by categorizing hierarchically your company by department and then by activity and then by how data passes back and forth. As soon as you do this, every single activity that produces or stores data, I guarantee you, stores that data in some sort of database. Once you know what data your departments produce, you will know what databases they have. And this picture, databases can produce this picture automatically. You do not need a human being to document the meaning of 54 rows of data. Your database can do this automatically. Spend your human being's time documenting what's unique and specific about your company and let the computer do the rest, okay? Save your time. Be able to look what you're looking, be able to find what you're looking for by using the right search reference. Use an index, not a dictionary. It's the number one thing you can do. Number two, set up a modern data warehouse. As soon as you index the data that you have in your company, people will immediately start thinking, oh, we store sales and marketing information and customer complaints and user purchase history, we have a great opportunity to reach out to customers that have experienced a particular bug and offer them a solution to retain them. As soon as you show people how much data we have, people immediately creatively start to think about using multiple data from multiple sources to solve a problem. To do that, you need to get your data into a warehouse a common location or data from multiple sources can be used in together. So set up a warehouse. It's cheap. It's less than $1,000 a month. And once you have it, you will never want to go back. Make it the center of your data architecture. Copy data from different silos there once a day and see what happens in your company. See what types of problems people can solve. So you've inventoried your data using an index, not a dictionary. You've set up a data warehouse and you've given people access to it to solve problems. The third thing you can do is pay attention to what data people use. I promise you that people will be very interested in complete records of customers, specifically how to reach customers and their purchase history. Look at what data people use and then begin to institute formatting standards for the data everyone wants to use. Companies these days have thousands, maybe 10,000 different tables with different columns of data. It is not worth your time to control the contents of all of them, but it is worth your time to tell the producers of the data how to produce data in a common format. Okay. So here on the left are just some common requirements that people will put upon the data producers because a lot of people begin to rely on their data. You do this, you'll make many of your consumers happy. You will fix one data problem at the source and a help of 100 different people in the destination. This is how you fix issues at the root. You understand the nature of your company's data production activities. You bring the data together so that people can solve problems using data from many sources. And then you pay attention to usage and improve the quality of the data that actually gets used.
you can do these things immediately. So let's say that you do do these things immediately and you start to be able to use your data in more ways. It starts to help the company. I wanna give you a few more tips for how to improve the long-term value of your data. Okay. The most important thing you can do to improve the long-term value of your data is to establish a data management practice. This whole presentation is happening because I am a data management expert. Having an awareness of data management is very important for companies that want to compete in the digital space. The data management department's responsibility is to make sure that data has positive economic value for the company and for the customer. The primary way that they do this is by creating better data architecture to build solutions with and to create an analytics department to find out what those solutions have to be. It's not the only thing that a data management department does, but it's the two most important things. So let's take a look at those two. Architecture. We sometimes don't think about architecture, but it's what we're sitting on. We're able to work and do the things that we do because somebody designed the systems that we operate in. Somebody designed the internet. That's how I'm able to deliver information to you right now. So good data architecture. Why do we need it? It helps you develop products quickly. Remember the dream of success for the new fintech? You need to develop a portfolio of customizable products and you need to be able to customize them for the, com for the customer at the right time. How do you think that happens? This happens because your product development sits on top of your data foundation. Your product development uses the data in the warehouse. Your product development uses high quality data collected at the source because you have data requirements. The data architecture of the future will provide two foundations. One, quality foundation. Make sure the data that you collect is standardized, clean, available for use. And two, innovation foundation. You use the data you have to experiment and to acquire new information and make it available to people who are trying to design products. For technology companies of the future, there must be a data foundation that supports and enables product development. The next thing that you can do to improve the long-term value of your data is to invest in data analytics. Data analytics is not reporting. It's not, BS, it's not business intelligence. It's analyzing the data that you have. Why do you want to analyze the data that you have? Because you want to find new ways to use it, to disrupt existing approaches, to outcompete other companies and to drive innovation both internally for how your company works and externally what customer you can serve. A strong data analytics team has a combination of these three skills. Business analysis, they can break down what your company needs to do. Database programming, they can work with data. They can do anything they want with data. They don't need to buy software to work with data. They know how to work with data. And lastly, scripting. They know how to automate. These three skills are jet fuel when combined. And when they are combined, here's what a thriving data analytics department can do for you. They can help you identify data that can be used for automation, both in-house and for making decisions that can deliver the right product to your customer at the right time. Remember, customization is going to be key. Data analytics, helps you find the data that can be used for automated decision-making. Data analysts will also help you control and improve your automated or manual processes and figure out where it's worth investing more development time. And because they're very familiar with the data, they're on the front lines of knowing what information is available and strategic to use to improve your company's profitability especially in the area of risk and credit. From the data analytics practice comes data science and machine learning.
This is how it works. You cannot have data science and machine learning or models that really work without a good data architecture foundation and a good data analytics department. Otherwise, you write a model and you have nowhere to de you have nowhere to deploy it because your company's data architecture is not set up to act on innovation. Here are your investments summarized. You need a foundation for data architecture. You need data analytics to figure out how to use the data you have. And when you do that, you will have automated decision making that can help you deliver and customize the right product at the right time at the right price. So I have some final thoughts because our time is drawing to a close. First, open banking requirements are data requirements. This is a wonderful thing for companies that have already invested in data quality. But for everyone else, this is the motivation that you need to build a more profitable, faster, more valuable product for your customers. Companies that invest in their data will win. In the past, they're profitable, but you know, probably not the most newsworthy. But in the future, companies that invest in the data will be able to positively, financially impact their anti-fraud, their operations, the credit risk, sales, marketing, customer retention, all these things that use data, companies that are data-driven will win. And lastly, zooming way out, stepping way back, open banking is the next step in an important evolution for humanity. Okay. When we give people ownership they feel responsible. And when they are responsible, they will have to make decisions that are better for them and improve the quality of their life. Open banking makes companies give ownership and responsibility of data back to the customer. But here's the thing, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a company or a person, you are responsible for every piece of data that you create and that is in your guardianship. You are responsible for every dollar that is created and in your guardianship. It is your finances, your data, and your future. We are all responsible for it. When we give people ownership and the ability to make decisions and we reward them for high quality, the world becomes a better place. I'd like to think that value grows from a place of ownership and quality. These are not two conflicting ideas. It's not money or quality. When it comes to data, you can have both. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being able to give this presentation to everybody here. And um, I hope we can keep in touch. Please don't hesitate to reach out.